Everyone, thanks for being with us today at Church Online. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Pastor Ali. I have the honor of serving as an executive pastor here at Life Church and also as the campus pastor at our location in McCungy. It's been a, quite a while since I've been on Church Online, so I'm really excited to be with you today. But I just wanted to let you know there's a little baby hanging out in our studio today, and they wouldn't let me have her for the message because she's. they said it was her nap time. But if you hang with me throughout the message, I promise you, no matter how bad the message stinks, you will get to see a cute baby be at the end, I promise. So hang with me. We're in our series about heroes of the faith. We've been talking about Hebrews 11 all summer, and today we're taking up the story of Rahab. So let's look at the account of her faith found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. But before we do that, before we get into the word, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share your word with your people. I pray today that you would speak through my vocal cords, that you would think through my mind. I pray there would be less of me and more of you, none of me and all of you. That you would make my tongue as the pen of a ready writer, and you would write your word on the tablet of your people's hearts. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do what only you can do today. That you would take the preached and proclaimed word of God and sow it deep into our hearts, and you would bring forth a harvest of 30, 60, and 100 fold. So people walk away from church online today and they're changed, forever ever changed, not by what a man says, but by what you say through your word and through your spirit. It's in Jesus name that I pray and everyone said, amen. So Hebrews 11 and 31, that's where we pick up the one verse in Hebrews 11 about the story of Rahab. It says, it was by faith that Rahab the prostitute, Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Rahab is the second woman of faith highlighted in Hebrews chapter 11, the first one being Sarah, who bore the promised child Isaac by faith, even when her and her husband Abram were way past childbearing years. But as we talk about faith, I want to just kind of start off with this simple definition of faith. Faith is acting like God is telling the truth. Faith is basically that simple. Faith is acting like God is telling the truth. Faith is acting like it's so, even when it's not so, in order that it may become so, just because God said so. That's our definition of faith. Our definition of faith is placing our trust in the integrity of God, placing our trust in the integrity of God's character, acting like what God says is the truth. And as we talk about this, we're brought to this interesting character and her name is Rahab. And my, my, my question to you today is, why couldn't God say in Hebrews 11, it was by faith that Rahab was not destroyed? Why does, it has, why does God say specifically Rahab the prostitute? Why does God put Rahab's business all out on the streets for lack of better words. Why does God spill the tea about what Rahab and what she does? That's the question. He could have just said Rahab was delivered, but no, he wants you to know that she's a prostitute. Why does God want us to know that Rahab was a prostitute? I believe it's this simple. If a prostitute can be a great person of faith, that gives us hope that you can be a great person of faith and that I can be a great person of faith. If a prostitute can be a great person of faith, you and I can too. Rahab had a bad reputation. She was immoral. She's called a prostitute. That means that everybody in town knew she was a prostitute. Everybody thought about her the same way. And if you're selling your body to make a living, I gotta tell you, you your self-esteem is probably almost less than zero. Your self-value is almost less than zero. Your self-worth is probably less than, than zero. She's lost her value, she's lost her purity, she's lost her self-esteem, and she's lost her reputation. She's somebody that most people wouldn't invite to church, but God says, I can take this person and I can not only use them, I can place them in the hall of faith. So the, we, we, we saw the one verse in Hebrews 11 that kind of encapsulates the story, but the whole story is in Joshua chapter two, and we're gonna take it up from there. But before we do that, let me just give you the context of Joshua chapter two. Israel has been delivered from Egypt. They've spent 40 years in the wilderness. 
they've crossed over and they're just about to take the first city, the city of Jericho. And God says to Joshua, what I want you to do is I want you to march around the walls of Jericho six times, six times. And then I want you to do it one more time. And when you do it that time and give a shout, the walls are going to fall. So this is the context. Israel is about to conquer Jericho. And this is what happens in Joshua 2 and 1. He says, then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men sat, set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. So here's my question that this verse brings to mind. Why did, these, why did these men, why did these spies go to the house of a prostitute? Why did they go to a, a, the house of a prostitute? What were they doing in the red light district? What were they doing in the wrong part of town? I would suggest it's this, they were men. And they knew that if they went to the house of a prostitute, that somebody would open up the door and let them in because they're men. And they felt like this was a good place to hide. So they were, they were hiding out. But somehow the king of Jericho spots them, and we find this out in verses two and three. And it reads like this. Someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab. So the king of Jericho sends men to Rahab's house and says, bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the whole land. What's he saying? We got some men. You think they're clients, but they're not. They're spies, send them out so that we can kill them. Now we're introduced to Rahab. Rahab to, has, to respond, has to respond to this request from the king. Verses four through six, Rahab had hidden the two men, so she's already hidden them, but she replied, yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. They left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you can probably catch up with them. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Rahab's lucky that her nose didn't grow. She told the men a big fat whopping lie. And then, because verse six says, actually she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath bundles of flax she had laid out. Rahab lied to the king's men. That brings me to this theological question. Is it ever okay to lie? Is it ever okay to tell a lie? And I would say that, that in this situation, Rahab was confronted with two evils. She could either tell a lie or she could turn the Israelite spies over to their death. And what I would say to us is the, the theological position here is this. Whenever we are caught between two sins, we need to make the choice that, bring God, that brings God the greatest glory. So if you're caught between the sin of telling a lie or turning men over to their death, she chooses the, the, the lesser sin and the sin that by doing so will give God the greater glory and she preserves the men's life. It's the same thing as a lot of the, the tragedy that happened during the Holocaust of World War II. There were Germans that hid Jewish people that the Nazis were looking to kidnap and kill and they hid them and they had to lie to the Nazis and say, we do not have any Jews in our house. And they did that to preserve life. They chose the lesser of two evils. They chose to sin that gave God the greatest glory. Another example would be, this is just a, it's a kind of a silly example, but if a thief broke into your house in the middle of the night and held a gun to your child's head and said, you either have a choice right now, you can tell me a lie or I'll shoot your child in the head. What would you as a parent do? If you're a parent, what would you do? You could make a decision and say, I'm a person of integrity. I'm not going to tell a lie and you'll have one less child. Or you can say, I'm going to tell a lie. Your child is going to get set free. In that instance, you choose, you chose the lesser of two evils and you chose the sin that ultimately brought God the greatest glory because it preserved life. I say all that to say Rahab lied. And then in verse 7, because she lied, so the king's men went looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. And as soon as the king's men had left, the gate of Jericho was shut. So the spies are safe because Rahab lied and she hid them. Jericho is about to go down. And here we go. Verses 8 and 9. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk with them. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. How does Rahab know that the Lord had given Israel this land? We see it in verses 10 and 11. 
For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you. This is Rahab talking to the spies. We have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Sihon and Og and the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. This is what Rahab said. She said, I might be a prostitute, but I'm not crazy. The word is out. We're trembling. And even though I know my lifestyle is messed up, that things are not right, I want to affirm right here and right now that your God is the one true God. She expressed faith in God in that moment. Now let's look at this for a little bit. 40 years ago, God opened up the Red Sea. So this is a 40 year old story that Rahab is placing faith in. It's not something that just happened yesterday. And in fact, it's such an old story that all of Jericho knew about it. And all of Jericho trembled because of it. The difference though between Rahab and everybody else in Jericho is that Rahab responds to the story. She responds to the information. So you see, it's one thing to come to church and hear the word. It's one thing to log on to church online and hear the word, and it's another thing to respond to it. There is a difference between hearing God's word and responding to God's word. For 40 years, this story had been going around Jericho. And we know it had gotten through to the people because Rahab says, we're all scared. The word is out that your God is serious. Your God is real. And I want you to know that I believe in your God. Now, here's the point. At this statement, Rahab had to go against the crowd. And sometimes our faith is gonna to have to cause us to go against the crowd because nobody else is believing this but Rahab. And in a moment, you'll see that her family believes because of her, but everybody else has heard the same word, but not responded to it. And that's why the city of Jericho is falling to judgment. That's why they're candidates for judgment because they heard the word, but they didn't respond. But Rahab says, I believe your God is the God of heaven and earth. I don't know everything about your God. In fact, I know a little bit about your God, not very much. She didn't have all the information, but what she did have was faith faith in the information that she had. Rahab didn't have all the information, but she had faith in the information she had. Rahab was an outcast who believed. Rahab, who's a prostitute, they want you to know, both in Joshua and in Hebrews, that she's a prostitute, but she is an outcast who believes. And sometimes we can't hang with the crowd. We have to stand up for our faith because if Rahab would have hung with the crowd, nobody would have ever known her name. And she would just been another statistic of somebody was, that was killed when Jericho fell. She, if she would have said, well, nobody else is gonna react. Nobody else is gonna respond. Let me just go along with the crowd. She would have been killed with everybody else in Jericho. And God allowed the spies to come to her house. Watch this, because even though she was not everything she was supposed to be, she believed the little bit, the little bit that she knew. And God responds to what we know. God responds to what we know. Listen. Most of us don't need to know more. We need to do something with what we already know. We have to do something with the information that we have. We got to work with the word that we already know. She let the spies hide because of her faith, because the word of God had gotten out and she confesses, confesses allegiance to the one true God, not to the king, not to his constituency, not to the men that he sends to his house, not to the general crowd in Jericho. When God disagrees with the crowd, you better stick with God. When you take a, when you take a popularity poll and everybody else is lined up against God, that's not the time to go with the majority. That's the time to go with God because God by himself is a majority. By himself, God is a majority. So what she did was she identified with God, God's people and God's purposes. And her faith, what she said she believed demonstrated, watch this, her faith demonstrated itself in what she did.
Hebrews 11 says, by faith, Rahab hid the spies. By faith, she did it because, because she believed what she believed about God. She did what she did with the spies. Because Rahab believed what she believed about God, she did what she did with the spies. At great risk to herself, she did what she did because she believed what she believed. And James recounts the same story in James chapter 2. And we'll pick it up in verse 24, but this is what James writes. He says, so you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. And in that, in that chapter two, James introduces this theological concept called the concept of justification by works. Now listen. Don't turn this off and don't get scared that I'm talking about we're saved by what we do. We're not. We're saved by grace alone, by faith in Jesus Christ alone. But justification by works has to do with sanctification, our being set aside for God, not salvation, our final destination, with, which is heaven. In other words, what you, when you believe as a Christian and when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, that secures you forever for heaven. But then what we need to do is we need to act on what we believe, demonstrating that we don't just intellectually believe in Jesus Christ, but the information is dropped from our head to our heart and faith is born in our heart. And it's a practical functional lifestyle that's born out in the way that we're living. When what we believe in our head gets into our heart, then it hits our feet. That's when we as a church, as a body of believers, that's when you as an individual Christian, that's when you become useful to God. Rahab's decision to obey God, Rahab's decision to place faith in God made her useful to God in history. In, the same, in that same chapter, we'll back up three verses in James 2, and James talks about Abram. And he says, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He, he was even called the friend of God. Listen. Abraham's faith saved him back in Genesis chapter 15. What James is talking about happened in Genesis chapter 22. This is not talking about the saving faith. Here's the principle, don't miss this. When we live by faith and it shows up in our works, we become a candidate for God breaking through on our behalf in history. When we live by faith and it shows up in our works, we become candidates for God breaking through on our behalf in history. Justification by faith takes us to heaven. The only way we're getting to heaven is by faith in Jesus Christ. But justification by works brings heaven to us. By obeying God and conforming your life to the standards of this world, by, by, of this word, by leaning on his promises and on his integrity, what happens is we don't get to go to heaven that way. We only get to go to heaven through Jesus. But by leaning on the promises of God, we get to bring heaven down to earth. When Abraham was justified by works, the Bible says that that's when he got his blessing on the earth. God fulfilled his promise. The promise became an oath and God carries out what he said he was going to do because of the work that Abraham had done, because he offered Isaac on the altar. Listen, until our faith becomes functional, until we stop talking about what we believe and start walking like we really do believe, we will never see God break through in history. You'll never be able to do what Rahab did. You'll never be able to do what Rahab is getting to do. She was getting ready to cut a deal with heaven. Back to Joshua chapter two, let's look at verses 12 and 13. This is Rahab talking to the spies again and she says this, now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all their families. Listen, she says, I acted by faith and I hid you 
and I lied to the king's men. Because of that, I'm asking you to allow your God to bless me this side of heaven. The Bible says in Mark 10, one of the rewards of being a disciple of Jesus that is a visible public representative of Jesus Christ is that God rewards us not just in heaven, but also here on this earth. Look at Mark 10 verses 29 through 31. Yes, Jesus replied, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return, now in return, a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and property along with persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be least important then. And those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. What Mark is saying, what Jesus is teaching in that passage is our reward for serving God, our reward for living by faith is both now in this life and also in heaven. So Rahab, she says, I need God to honor me now in this life, right here in history on the earth. And so she cuts a deal with God and she cuts a deal with the spies. Verse 14 reads, we offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the men agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. They're saying this, God saw what you did for us. The spies are saying, Rahab, God saw what you did for us. God is going to look after you because of what you did for us. When we come to take over the land, because of what you did, because you validated your faith, because you acted by faith, God will honor you when we come to conquer the land. So my question for everyone today is this, what are we doing that is visible, practical, demonstrable, verifiable? What are we doing that proves that we believe what we cannot see? Rahab's faith showed up in her works. Her faith showed up in what she did. And look at what happened, verses 15 and 16. Then since Rahab's house was built into the town wall, she let them down by a rope through the window. Escape to the hill country, she told them. Hide there for three days from the men searching for you. Then when they have returned, you can go on your way. So she lets them escape and she gives them a strategy for their deliverance. And then in verses 17 through 20, here's the promise to Rahab. Before they left, the men told her, we will be bound by the oath we have taken only if you follow these instructions. When we have come into the land, you must leave this scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you have let us down. And all your family members, your father, mother, brothers, and all your relatives must be here inside the house. If they go out into the street and are killed, it will not be our fault. But if anyone lays a hand on people inside this house, we will accept the responsibility for their death. If you betray us, however, we are not bound by this oath in any way. What do the spies tell her to let out the window? It's a scarlet thread. Scarlet is what? It's red. Red's the cover of the blood. Red's the color of the Passover lamb that the Israelites posted on their doorsteps or their, their door, their, the top of their doors so that the angel of death would pass over the nation of Israel and only go to the nation of Egypt. Blood is the bl red is the blood that Jesus Christ poured out for you and poured out for me on the cross. What does this symbolize to, this, to us? Whenever the blood of Jesus Christ is applied to our lives, Satan loses his power because he cannot handle the blood. So the blood, the red, was the sign of deliverance for Rahab and her family. And we see this in verses 22 to 25. Meanwhile, Joshua was said to the two spies, keep your promise. This is chapter six, verses 22 to 25. Keep your promise. Go to the prostitute's house and bring her out along with all her family. The men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, mother, brothers, and all the other relatives who were with her. They moved her whole family to a safe place near the camp of Israel. Then the Israelites burned the town and everything in it. Only the things made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron were kept for the treasury of the Lord's house. So Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute and her relatives who were with her in the house because she had hidden the spies Joshua sent to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. Listen, 
This is the one time that Rahab's family didn't mind being associated with Rahab. This is the one time that Rahab's family wasn't embarrassed that Rahab was a, was a prostitute. You know why? Because this was the time for deliverance. This was the time that even though she was part of the house of ill repute, even though she was a prostitute, she was also her family's deliverer because her faith was now overriding her occupation. Her, her faith was now overriding her back Background. Her faith was now overriding her past, and now she is headed to a brand new tomorrow. F Rahab's faith overrode her yesterday and gave her a brand new tomorrow. I wonder if there's anybody who's watching this today that you made mistakes yesterday, you blew it yesterday, you made a wrong choice yesterday, you sinned yesterday. You're not Rahab the prostitute, but maybe you're Bob the blank, Jim the blank, Sue the blank, Betty the blank, Ruth the blank, Jack the blank. Whatever you are, I'm telling you that you can still become a man or a woman of faith. I'm here to tell you that your faith can override your yesterday and put you in God's faith hall of fame. It doesn't excuse yesterday. It doesn't mean there aren't consequences for yesterday, but it means that faith in the living God, because of his grace and his mercy, he can override your past. Because not only does she deliver herself, not only does she liberate her family, she's the least likely person to succeed, and she delivers herself and her family. But that would be enough if all she did was deliver her family. But here's a prostitute that allowed faith to escort her out of her current situation into a brand new tomorrow. And faith can escort you out of your current situation into a brand new tomorrow. And if that was the end of the story, that'd be fantastic, but it's not. Because the rest of the story is so amazing. And we see it in Matthew 1 and verse 5. It says this, Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. So let's talk about the rest of the story. In Joshua 2, Rahab expressed her faith in God, and that faith overrode the disgrace of being a prostitute, and it delivered her from the wrath of God who took out the city of Jericho. When the Israelites saw the red rope, which represents the blood of Jesus Christ and her deliverance, when it was hanging out the window, they went in and she got a military escort out of the city that was about to be destroyed. She was a prostitute, but she goes from a prostitute to being a proselyte. And a proselyte is somebody who adopts the Jewish faith. Not only did she used to be a prostitute, but now she's a used to be prostitute who's adopted into the family of God and she's hanging out with the family of God. And now here's a woman. She had been with any number of men. She had been used and abused by people. She had been disregarded, discounted, and discarded. And she runs into this guy named Salmon. And because she's been adapted into the family of Israel, even though she was born pagan and lived pagan, and all that she had was regret about the, back end, the, the front end of her life, while she was hanging around in Israel, she ran into a, name, a man named Salmon. And listen, if you know anything about the story, Salmon was a Jewish man that shouldn't have been hanging out with a non-Jewish woman, especially a non-Jewish woman that had the reputation that Rahab had. But because she had exercised her faith and because she had been redeemed into the nation of Israel, God actually makes Salmon fall in love with her. Because God made Rahab brand new by his grace, Salmon falls in love with Rahab who's now living with the people of God. And he goes so far that he marries her. He goes so far as to marry the woman that used to be a prostitute because he knew what the grace of God had done in her life. And they come together and they have a baby boy and that baby's boy is named Boaz. If you know anything about Salmon, he must have been pretty rich because when we read the book of Ruth, we see that his son Boaz had it going on. He had all kinds of money and all kinds of stuff. And, and Boaz 
falls in love with this widow woman named Ruth. You can read about it in the book of Ruth. And through a series of events that the Bible historians call the kinsman redeemer, it works out so that Boaz marries Ruth. And then Ruth has a baby whose name is Obed. And Obed has a baby whose name is Jesse. And Jesse has a baby whose name is David. And David becomes the first of the household of faith in the line of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Watch this, Rahab exercised her faith. God overcame her past, delivered her, delivered her family, placed her forever recorded in the genealogy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you get no higher honor than that, this side of heaven. Talk about going from the outhouse to the White House. This woman went from being a prostitute to being in the lineage of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when you look at Jesus' lineage, he's got some evil people in that lineage. There's some wicked people, there's some murderers, but all of those people somewhere along the line responded to the truth of God's word, placed their faith and their trust in him. And it can be said of Rahab the prostitute that she is the great grandmother of David who is the head of the house of Jesus Christ. That's her lasting record. And God wants you to know this today. If you're a thief, you can change that by faith. If you're immoral, you can change that by faith. If you're dubious, you can change that by faith. If you're addicted, you can change that by faith. You can change it all by faith. And your name doesn't have to be rec recorded with where you were, but God can meet you where you were and take you to where he wants you to be. Our name doesn't have to be recorded by what we were, but by how God met us where we were and took us to where he wants us to be. Listen, church, God is greater than our yesterdays. That is the magnificent grace of God. So since the price has been paid, if you place faith in Christ, and you identify with God's purposes, and you lean on his integrity, and you lean on his promises, he'll deliver you from where you are and to where you're ultimately supposed to wind up. God is greater than our yesterdays. So what I wanna do right now, church, is this. If you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've never accepted the sacrifice that he made for you on the cross, if you say, Ollie, I'm trapped in my yesterday, I'm trapped being a thief, I'm trapped being a liar, I'm trapped being a murderer, I'm trapped being an adulterer, I'm trapped being an addict, I'm telling you that today can be the first day of the rest of your life and it can all change for you now in a moment. All you have to do is exercise faith in the fact that Jesus Christ on that cross 2,000 years ago bore the penalty for your sins that you deserve, bore the death penalty for the sin that I deserve, and I placed my faith in him and he sits on the right hand of God the Father forever praying for me and every other person that said yes to Jesus. Paul teaches us this simple truth in Romans 10. He says this, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. So right there on the other side of this screen, I want you to pray this prayer with me out loud like you mean it. Say this, say Jesus is Lord. Say it again, say Jesus is Lord. Say I believe in my heart God raised him from the dead by believing in my heart I'm made right with God by openly declaring my faith, I am saved. Say it again, say I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church. Joneth and that cute baby Ezra are coming up right next. And if you just said yes to Jesus, she's gonna give you some instructions on what to do, but we love you. Have a fantastic week.